All right, so in the last slide, I was just briefly going over finding areas under the curve, and I just wanted to make sure that you understood how to do this next approach. Um, I just want you to understand that right here, um, the second way to do this is to find the area under the curve all the way um, on this right-hand side and then on this left-hand side over here. So you can find the area to this left-hand side. So it's, remember on your, um, Remember on your chart, when you look up negative 1.25, that's always gonna be the area to the left, so you can subtract that area. And then you wanna find the area to the right over here of z equals 0.81. The tricky part about that is, remember if you look up 0.81 on your curve or on your chart, that's always gonna be the area to the left. However, if you look up negative 0.81, since the curve is symmetric, the area of negative 0.81 is the exact same thing as the area of 0.81. So you'd want to look up negative 0.81 that would represent this exact same area. Okay, so just keep that in mind that your curve is symmetric. Um, so if we take the whole area of the curve 100% minus the area to the left of negative 1.25 and to the right of 0.81, that gives me the same answer of 0.6854. All right, I would highly suggest using your graphing calculator to do this. It's gonna be much easier than using the table. So here's how you do this on your graphing calculator. You're gonna hit second and then VARS, which is the distribution piece right here. So notice distribution, normal distribution, okay? You're gonna go down to number two, normal CDF. What does that mean? That means normal cumulative density function. So that means I'm adding up all of the areas that I'm specifying, okay? Here's how it works. Once you once normal CDF comes up, you're gonna hit enter for number two. It's gonna come off on your graphing calculator. You're gonna think about your curve. What is the lower bound? What is the upper bound mean and standard deviation? So for example, if we're talking about the areas of less than 0.54, if you were to draw your curve, okay, let's say we're gonna draw our curve. Okay, if I'm gonna draw my curve and I have 0.54 right here, less than 0.54, what is that lower bound? We'll sort of think of this as like negative 1,000, okay, or some big negative number. That would be your lower bound because that's on the left-hand side. Your upper bound is 0.54. We're specifically talking about the standard normal distribution. Since we're talking about the standard normal distribution, that means the mean is one and the standard deviation is zero. We're looking at z-scores, okay? So then you would type in zero for the mean and the standard deviation is one, okay? Or any the calculator automatically does the uh, mean and standard deviation for the standard normal curve, okay? So if we were talking about greater than negative 1.12, we would do normal CDF, okay? And you'd think about what is your lower bound, negative 1.12, what's your upper bound? Some big number, 1,000, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Although you don't have to type in zero and one, if you're doing the standard normal curve, okay? And if it's helpful for you to draw a picture, go for it. Okay, negative 1.12, okay, shade in. We want everything greater than that. We have our lower bound, negative 1.12, and it, we're shading all the way up to infinity. So go ahead and try C, D, and E, and on the next page, just go ahead and check your answer. Okay. So go ahead and check your answer. Notice these are all in terms of z-scores. And since they're all in terms of z-scores, that's why we could use the standard normal curve. I would always say to round to four uh, decimal places for accuracy. And just keep that in mind as you're going um, throughout the course. And when it says within 1.5 standard deviations, that means that that's 1.5 above and 1.5 below, not just 1.5 above. All right, so we're gonna be working backwards in this course. So if, let's say we're given the percentile, we're given the area under the curve, how can we work backwards to find the z-score? So a distribution of test scores is approximately normal and Joe scores at the 85th percentile. All right, so this is the area under the curve, so 85th percentile means that 85% is below her, so right here, okay? We wanna know how many standard deviations above the mean did she score? So if we have a mean of zero, 
basically what we want to do is we want to find the z-score. So we know the area under the curve, but we don't know the z-score. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to use your graphing calculator. Okay. Think about this as doing the opposite. Before we had the z-score, we found the area. Now we're doing the inverse. We're given the area, now we need to find the z-score. So in the same place, hit second bars, which is distribution. Go down to number three where it says inverse norm. Inverse norm means you're giving the calculator the area, you're doing the opposite. It's then going to give you the z-score. So after inverse norm, you type in the area and it will give you the associated z-score. But just keep in mind, when you type in inverse norm, it's always giving you the area to the left. So if you type in inverse norm of 0.85, that's the area, this is saying this is the z-score, 0.85 is everything below it. So 1.03 is your z-score, but inverse norm 0.85 is the area below 85%. So you have to read the questions carefully, and if it's helpful to draw a picture, please do so. Okay, so once again, let's find the z-score given the percentile. In a normal distribution, quarter one is how many standard deviations below the mean. Try question two, find the z-value that corresponds to the given area. So here's my area. This whole thing right here is 0.8962. So go ahead and try that on your graphing calculator. If you need to hit pause and then check your answer. Okay, so quarter one is the 25th percentile, so this means that 25% of the curve will be shaded. And in this case, Okay, that's not, if, you're, if you want to draw it, 25% will be shaded. So here's your 25%. Okay, it's below this z-score that we're looking for, so we can just do inverse norm of 0.25, and it gives you a negative number that tells us it's 0.6745 standard deviations below the mean. Now this one's a little bit different. Notice here, this gave us the area to the right. Well, if I type in, if you just type in, inverse norm of 0.8962, that's going to give you this area to the left, or that's going to give you the z-score over here to the left. That's not what I want. So when you have this z-score, you have to find what the area to the left of the z-score is before you type that in. How do you get that? You do 1 minus the area that you have because it's 100%. So that, this area right here, is 0.1038. Now I can find the um, inverse norm of that, which gives me my z-score of negative 1.26. So just be really careful when you're reading your questions. All right, so how do we solve problems with normal distributions? Uh, keep this in mind for future questions. Anytime we're dealing with any distribution, you always want to state what that distribution is so that people reading the questions that you're working on know you're specifically talking about a normal distribution. Later on, we'll be doing t distributions, binomial distributions. They all have the same notation, so normal distribution with a mean and the standard deviation. You're always going to draw a picture of the distribution and shade the area that you want to find under the curve. It helps you visualize what you're doing. Then you're going to perform your calculations. You're, when you do this, when you're given a probability statement, you must show the z-score and your work. Okay? You're going to show two probability statements when you do normal curve calculations. For example, you'll show like the probability that x is greater than 35. Then you'd have your z-score, so z, your work for your z-score, I'm just making numbers up, 10 minus 2 divided by 5 equals whatever, and then the probability that z is greater than whatever. You're showing the standardization of the problem. Always make sure you write your conclusion in context and show your work. All right, so what do you need to avoid and how do you get full credit on your test quizzes and AP exams? Make sure to avoid calculator speak on the AP exam and on homeworks and tests and quizzes. So what is calculator speak? If you just write normal CDF, here's your lower bound, upper bound, mean, standard deviation, it's going to be marked wrong. Well, why? Because every calculator is different, and the readers of the AP exam, I don't know what calculator you're using, so this doesn't tell me that you know how to do the problem and understand where you're getting that z-score from. So you have to show your work, um, but you'll be given a couple of examples on the next few slides. Remember, though, you can always um, go back to the extra practice and get some extra practice to show uh, what work you'll need to show. Okay, so go ahead and try this one and then take a look at your answers. You can hit pause and see how you do. Okay, notice that we drew the curve. We shaded in. They're driving between 305 and 325. Okay, we stated what distribution we're talking about. 
Here's the X probability statement. So in terms of like this is your in context probability statement. All right, so what percent of the drives travel between 300 and 325 yards? And then here's your work for your Z-score, okay? Both of them, because you have two of them, there's the 305, the 325, your probability statement in terms of your Z-score, so it's between 0.13, 2.63, and then your answer as a sentence, okay? So 44% of his drives travel between 305 and 325. Honestly, if you wanna check your answer on the graphing calculator, go for it. You would just type in normal CDF. You would then type in, what is the lower bound? 305. What is the upper bound? 325. What is the mean? 304. What's the standard deviation? Eight. So do that. And if it, it's a multiple choice question, absolutely use it this way. But on the free response, you'll have to show all your work. All right, so go ahead and try this one and see how you do. Okay, all your steps are shown in these next couple of slides. So um, if you need to watch them, just go ahead and pause. Everything should be pretty self-explanatory. Okay, and like I said, you can get, get this on your graphing calculator, the final answer. In this case, if you're using your z-scores, you could do normal CDF. What's your lower bound? Negative 2.5. What's your upper bound? Negative 0.833. Why don't you need to type in zero and one? Because your calculator automatically does the standard curve, which is a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. If you wanted to do it on your calculator here, okay, you still have to show your work, but this verifies that you have the correct answer. You want it between 100 and 110. What's your mean? 115. What's your standard deviation? Six. Okay. Now, this one's a little bit tricky. So the fastest 30% go at least what speed? So here's the fastest 30%. We wanna know the Z-score, but I cannot type in inverse norm of 30%. If I type in inverse norm of 30%, all right, what that's gonna give me is that's gonna give me this area right here, okay? You have to, or that Z-score that corresponds to 30% below. So always draw a picture. You want to type in inverse norm of 70% because that's what's below your Z-score. Okay, um, your IQR here is when you type in your inverse norm, 25% is below your first one and 75% is below your third quartile. Okay, so we're kind of working backwards here. Finding your Z, you have your Z-score and then you're looking for what values, what actual X values are at those particular Z-scores. Okay, so how can we tell specifically if data is approximately normally distributed? There's lots of different ways, but we can only use statistical inference procedures if we know it's approximately normally distributed. So how can we tell? All right, number one, plot the data. That's one way to tell. Or you can make a dot plot, a stem plot, a histogram. Make sure that your graph is approximately symmetric and bell-shaped. The other way to check is to follow whether or not it follows a 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Basically what you're going to do is count how many observations are within one, two, and three standard deviations away from the mean, calculate those percentages. If it falls close to those percentages, maybe by one or two off, totally fine, then it's approximately normal. Okay. The other thing that we can do is take a look at normal probability plots. So many normal pro many um, software packages, including your graphing calculator, construct normal probability plots. What they do is they plot each observation in a data set against the z-score. So if the plots on a normal probability plot lie close to a straight line, then this tells us that the data are normal. If you have systematic deviation, so it's clearly curved, clearly, you know, there's a like a very clear pattern, then it's not normal. Outliers will appear as points that are far from the overall pattern. However, if you have like one or two departures from your um, from your graph, then that's totally fine. So if you take a look at this here, see my graph is skewed to the right. The normal probability plot, notice most of the data is bunched on the left-hand side, just like the data is bunched over here. So this is gonna tell us that this is not approximately normally distributed. Okay, here, once again, skewed to the right. Okay, because long right tail, notice you have a long right tail over here. Say the largest observations fall to the right of the skew. So if you're gonna draw a nice line here, 
Most of your observations are to the right of that. Don't worry about tiny little wiggles in the graph. Just look for shapes that are clear departures from normality. Nice approximately normally distributed, nice straight line. Skewed to the left, notice how this long left tail, the data is bunched on the right. Okay, all right, so 